Chapter One of Days with Sir Roger de Coverley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Elijah Fisher. Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Chapter One Sir Roger's Family. Having often received an invitation from my friend Sir Roger de Coverley to pass away a month with him in the country, I last week accompanied him thither, and am settled with him for some time at his country house, where I intend to form several ensuing speculations. Sir Roger, who is very well acquainted with my humour, lets me rise and go to bed when I please, dine at his own table or in my chamber, as I think fit, sit still, and say nothing without bidding me be merry. When the gentlemen of the country come to see him, he only shows me at a distance. As I have been walking in the fields, I have observed them stealing a sight of me over an edge, and have heard the knight desiring them not to let me see them, for that I hated to be stared at. I am the more as in Sir Roger's family, because it consists of sober and staid persons, for as the knight is the best master in the world, he seldom changes his servants, and as he is beloved by all about him, his servants never care for leaving him. By this means, his domesticks are all in years, and grown old with their master. You would take his valet de chambre for his brother. His butler is grey-headed. His groom is one of the gravest men that I have ever seen, and his coachman has the looks of a privy counsellor. You see, the goodness of the master, even in the old house-dog, and in a grey pad that is kept in the stable with great care and tenderness out of regard to his past services though he has been useless for several i could not but observe with a great deal of pleasure the joy that appeared in the countenance of these ancient domesticks upon my friend's arrival at his country seat some of them could not refrain from tears at the sight of their old master. Every one of them pressed forward to do something for him, and seemed discouraged if they were not employed. At the first time, the good old knight, with the mixture of the father and the master of the family, tempered the inquiries after his own affairs with several kind questions relating to themselves. This humanity and good nature engages everybody to him, so that when he is pleasant upon any of them, all his family are in good humor, and none so much as the person diverts himself with. On the contrary, if he coughs or betrays an infirmity of old age, it is easy for a stander-by to observe a secret concern in the looks of all his servants. My worthy friend has put me under the particular care butler, who is a very prudent man, and, as well as the rest of his fellow servants, wonderfully desires of pleasing me, because they have often heard their master talk of me as of his particular friend. My chief companion, when Sir Roger is diverting himself in the woods or the fields, is a very vulnerable man who is ever with Sir Roger, and has lived at his house in the nature of the chaplain above thirty years. This gentleman is a person of good sense and some learning, of a very regular life and obliging conversation. He heartily loves Sir Roger, 
and knows that he is very much in the old knight's esteem so that he lives in the family rather as a relation than a dependent i have observed in several papers that my friend sir roger amidst all of his good qualities is something of an humorist and that his virtues as well as imperfections are as it were tinged by a certain extravagance which makes them particularly his and distinguishes them from those of other men this cast of mind as it is generally very innocent in itself so it renders a conversation highly agreeable and more delightful than the same degree of sense and virtue would appear in their common ordinary colours as i was walking with him last night he asked me how i liked the good old man whom i have just now mentioned and without staying for my answer told me that he was afraid of being insulted with latin and greek at his own table for which reason he desired a particular friend of his at the university to find him out a clergyman rather of plain sense that much learning of a good aspect a clear voice a sociable temper and if possible a man that understood a little of backgammon my friend says sir roger found me out this gentleman who besides the endowments required of him is they tell me a good scholar though he does not show it i have given him the parsonage of the parish and because i know his value have settled upon him a good annuity for life if he outlives me he shall find that he was higher in my esteem then perhaps he thinks so he has now been with me thirty years and though he does not know i have taken notice of it has never in all that time asked anything of me for himself though he is every day soliciting me for some thing in behalf of one or other of my tenants his parishioners there has not been a lawsuit in the parish since he has lived among them if any dispute arises they apply themselves to him for the decision and if they do not acquiesce in his judgment which i think never happened above once or twice at most they appeal to me at his first settling with me i made him a present of all the good sermons which have been printed in english and only begged him that every sunday he would pronounce one of them in the pulpit accordingly he has digested them into such a series that they follow one another naturally and make a continued system of practical divinity as sir roger was going on in his story the gentleman we were talking of came up to us and upon the knights asking him who preached to tomorrow for it was saturday night told us the bishop of st asap in the morning and dr south in the afternoon he then showed us his list of preachers for the year where i saw with a great deal of pleasure archbishop tillotson bishop saunderson dr barrow dr calamy with several living authors who have published discourses of practical divinity i knew sooner saw this vulnerable man in the pulpit but i very much approved of my friends insisting upon the qualifications of a good aspect and a clear voice for i was so charmed with the gracefulness of his figure of delivery as well as with the discourses he pronounced that i think never passed any time more to my satisfaction a sermon repeated after this manner is like the composition of a poet and the mouth of a graceful actor i could hardly wish that more of our country clergy would follow this example 
and instead of wasting their spirits in laborious compositions of their own, would endeavour, after a handsome elocution, and all those other talents that are proper to enforce what has been penned by greater masters. This would not only be more easy to themselves, but more edifying to the people. End of chapter 1 Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter 2 of Days with Sir Roger de Coverley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele Chapter 2 Mr. Will Wimble I was yesterday morning walking with Sir Roger before his house. A country fellow brought him a huge fish, which, he told him, Mr. William Wimble had caught that very morning, and that he presented it with his service to him, and intended to come and dine with him. At the same time he delivered a letter which my friend read to me as soon as the messenger left. Sir Roger, I desire you to accept of a jack, which is the best I have caught this season. I intend to come and stay with you a week, and see how the perch bite in the Black River. I observed with some concern the last time I saw you upon the bowling green that your whip wanted a lash to it. I will bring half a dozen with me that I twisted last week, which I hope will serve you all the time you are in the country. I have not been out of the saddle for six days last past, having been at Eton with Sir John's eldest son. He takes to his learning hugely. I am your humble servant, Will William. This extraordinary letter and message that accompanied it made me very curious to know the character and quality of the gentleman who sent them, which I found follows. Will Wimble is younger brother to a baronet, and descended of the ancient family of the Wimbles. He is now between forty and fifty, but, being bred to have no business, and born to no estate, he generally lives with his elder brother as superintendent of his game. He hunts a pack of dogs better than any man in the country, and is very famous for finding out a hare. He is extremely well versed in all little handicrafts of an idle man. He makes a mayfly to a miracle, and furnishes the whole way with angle rods. As he is a good-natured, obvious fellow, and very much esteemed upon account of his family, he is a welcome guest at every house, and makes up a good correspondence among all the gentlemen about him. He carries a tulip rod in his pocket from one to another, or exchanges a puppy between a couple of friends that live perhaps in the opposite sides of the county. Will is a particular favorite of all the young hares, whom he fully obliges with a net that he has weaved, or a setting dog that he has made himself. He now and then presents a pair of garters of his own knitting to their mothers or sisters, and raises a great deal of mirth among them, by inquiring as often as he meets them how they wear. These gentlemanlike like manufacturers and obliging little humours make Will the darling of the country. Sir Roger was proceeding in the character of him, when we saw him make up to us with two or three hazel twigs in his hand that he had cut in Sir Roger's woods as he came through them in his to the house. I was very much pleased to observe, on one side, the hearty and sincere welcome for which Sir Roger received him, and on the other, the secret joy which his guest discovered at sight of the good old knight. After the first salutes were over, Will desired Sir Roger to lend him one of his servants to carry a set of shuttlecocks he had had with him in a little box to a lady that lived about a mile off, to whom, it seems, he had promised such a present 
for above this half year sir roger's back was no sooner turned but honest will began to tell of a large cock pheasant that he had sprung in one of the neighbouring woods with two or three other adventures of the same nature odd and uncommon characters are the game i worked for and most delight for which reason i was mo as much pleased with the novelty of the person that talked to me as he could be for his life with the springing of a pheasant and therefore listened to him with more than ordinary attention in the midst of his discourse the bell rung to dinner for the gentleman i had uh, been speaking of had the pleasure of seeing the huge jack he had caught served up for the first dish in a most sumptuous manner upon our sitting down to it he gave us a long account how he had looked it played with it foiled it and at length drew it out upon the black bank with several other particulars as did all the first course a dish of wild fowl that came afterwards furnished the conversation for the rest of the dinner which concluded with a light invention of wills for improving the quail pipe upon withdrawing into my room after dinner i was secretly touched with attention towards the honest gentleman that had dined with me and could not but consider with a great deal of concern how so good an heart and such busy hands were wholly employed in trifles that so much humanity should be so little beneficial to others and so industry so little advantageous to himself the same temper of mind and application to affairs might have recommended him to public esteem and have raised his fortune in another station of life what good to us his country or himself might not trader or merchant have done with such useful though ordinary qualifications will wimble is the case of many of a younger brother of a great family who would rather see their children starve like gentlemen than thrive in a trade or profession that is beneath their equality this humour fills several parts of europe with pride and beggary it is the happiness of a trading nation like ours that the younger sons though incapable of any liberal art or profession may be placed in such a way of life as may perhaps enable them to vie with the best of their family accordingly we find several citizens that were launched into the world with narrow fortunes rising by an honest industry to greater estates than those of their eldest brothers it is not improbable but will was formerly tried at divinity law or physic and that finding his genius did not lie that way his parents gave him up at length to his own inventions but certainly however improper he might have been for studies of a hatcher he was perfectly well turned for the occupations of trade and commerce as i think this is a point which cannot be too much inculcated i shall desire my reader to compare what i have here written with what i have said in my twenty-first speculation end of chapter two read by elijah fisher chapter three of days with sir roger de coverley this is a liverbox recording all liverbox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Elijah Fisher. Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Chapter 3. The Picture Gallery. I was this morning walking in the gallery when Sir Roger, at the end opposite to me, and advancing towards me, said he was glad to meet me among his relations with de Coverleys and hoped i liked the conversation of so much good company who were as silent as myself i knew he alluded to the pictures and as he is a gentleman who does not little value himself upon his ancient descent i expected he would give me some account we were now arrived at the upper end of the gallery when the knight faced towards one of the pictures and as we stood before it 
he entered into the matter after his blunt way of saying things as they occur to his imagination without regular introduction or care to preserve the appearance of a chain of thought it is said he worth while to consider the force of dress and how the persons of one age differ from those of another merely by that point one may observe also the general fashion of the age has been followed by one particular set of people in another and by them preserved from one generation to another thus the vast jetting coat and small bonnet which was the habit in harry the seventh time is kept on in the yeomen of the guard not without a good and politic view because they look a foot taller and a foot and a half broader besides that the cap leaves the face expanded and consequently more terrible and fitter to stand at the entrances of palaces this predecessor of ours you see is dressed after this manner and his cheeks would it be no longer than mine were he in a hat as i am he was the last man that won a prize in the tilt yard which is now common street before whitehall you see the lance that lies there by his right foot is shivered that lance of his adversary all to pieces and bury himself look you sir in this manner at the same time he came within the target of the gentleman who rode against him and taking him with incredible force before him on the pommel of his saddle he let in that manner rid the tournament over and with an air that showed he did it rather to perform the rule of the lists than expose his enemy however it appeared he knew how to use of a victory and with a gentle trot he marched up to a gallery where their mistresses sat for they were rivals and let him down with laudable courtesy and pardonable insults i don't know but it might be exactly where the coffee-house is now you are to know this my ancestor was not only of a military genus but also for the arts of peace for he played on the bays in life as well as any gentleman at court you see where his vile hands by his basket built sword the action of the tilt yard you may be sure won the fair lady who was a maid of honour and the greatest beauty of her time here she stands the next picture you see sir my great 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 grandmother has on the new-fashioned petticoat except that the modern is gathered at the waist my grandmother appears if she stood in a large drop as the ladies now walk as if they were in a go-cart for all this lady was bred in the court she became an excellent country wife she brought ten children and when i show you the library you shall see in her own hand allowing for the difference of the language the best receipt now in england for a hasty pudding and a white pot if you please to fall back a little because it is necessary to look at the three next pictures at one view these are three sisters she on the right hand was who is so very beautiful died a maid the next to her still handsomer had the same fate against her will this homely thing in the middle had both their portions added to her own and was stolen by a neighbouring gentleman a man of stratagem and resolution for he was poisoned three mastiffs to come at her and knocked down two dear steamers in carrying her off misfortunes in all families the theft of this rum and so much money was no great matter to our estate but the next hair that possessed it was the soft gentleman whom you see there observe the small buttons the little boots the laces the slashes the clothes and above all the posture he is drawn in which to be sure 
was his own choosing. You see, he sits with one hand on a desk, writing, and looks at it as if it were another way, like an easy writer or a sonneteer. He was one of those that had too much wit to know how to live in the world. He was a man of no justice, but great good manners. He ruined everybody that had anything to do with him, but never said a rude thing in his life. The most idolent person in the world. He would sign a deed that passed away half his estate with the gloves on, but would not put on his hat before a lady if it were to save his country. He is said to be the first that made love by squeezing the hand. He left the estate with ten thousand pounds death upon it. But, however, by all hands I have been informed that he was every way the finest gentleman in the world, that debt lay heavy on her house for one generation, but it was retrieved by gift from that honest man you see there, a citizen of our name, but nothing at all akin to us. I know Sir Andrew Freeport had said behind my back that this man was descended from one of the ten children of the maid of honor. I showed you above, but it was never made out. We think at the thing because money was wanting at that time. Here I saw my friend a little embarrassed, and turned my face to the next portraiture. Sir Roger went on with his account of the gallery in the following manner. This man, pointing to him, I looked at, I take to be the honor of our house. Sir Humphrey D. Coverley was in his dealings as punctual as a tradesman and as generous as a gentleman. He would have thought himself as much undone by breaking his word as if it were to be followed by a bankruptcy. He served his country as knight of the shire to his dying day. He found it no easy matter to maintain an integrity in his words and actions, even in that he regarded the offices which were incumbent upon him in the care of his own affairs and relations of life, and therefore dreaded, though he had great talents, to go into employments of state, where he must be exposed to the snares of ambition. Innocence of life and great ability were the distinguishing parts of his character. The latter, he had often observed, had led to the destruction of the former, and used frequently to lament that great and good had not the same signification. He was an excellent husband then, but had resolved not to exceed such a degree of wealth. All above it he bestowed in secret bounties many years after the sum he aimed at for his own use was attained. Yet he did not slacken his industry but to a decent old age spent the life and fortune which was scrupulous to himself in the service of his friends and neighbors. Here we were called to dinner, and Sir Roger ended the discourse of this gentleman by telling me, as we followed the servant, that this his ancestor was a brave man, and narrowly escaped being killed in the civil wars. He said, he was sent out of the field on a private message the day before the battle of Worcester. The whim of narrowly escaping by having been within a day of danger, with other matters above mentioned, mixed with good sense, left me at a toss whether I was more delighted with my friend's wisdom or simplicity. End of chapter 3 Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter 4 of Days with Sir Roger de Coverley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Chapter 4 A Country Sunday. I am always very well pleased with a country Sunday, and think if keeping holy the seventh day were only a human institution, it would be the best method that could have been thought of 
for the polishing and civilizing of mankind it is certain the country people would soon degenerate into a kind of savages and barbarians were there not such frequent returns of a stated time in which a whole village meet together with their best faces and in their cleanest habits to converse with one another upon indifferent subjects hear their duties explained to them and join together in adoration of the supreme being sunday clears away the rust of the whole week not only as it refreshes in their minds the notions of religion but it puts both the sexes upon appearing in their most agreeable forms and exerting all such qualities as are apt to give them a figure in the eye of the village a country fellow distinguishes himself as much in the churchyard as a citizen does upon the change the whole parish politics being generally discussed in that place after the sermon or before the bell rings my friend sir roger being a good churchman has beautified the inside of his church with several texts of his own choosing he has likewise given a handsome pulpit cloth and railed in the communion table at his own expense he has often told me that at his coming to his estate he found his parishioners very irregular and that in order to make them kneel and join in their responses he gave every one of them a hassock and a common prayer-book and at the same time employed an itinerant singing master who goes about the country for that purpose to instruct them rightly in the tunes of the psalms upon which they now very much value themselves and indeed outdo most of the country churches that i have ever heard as sir roger is landlord to the whole congregation he keeps them in very good order and will suffer nobody to sleep in it besides himself for if by chance he has been surprised into a short nap at sermon upon recovering out of it he stands up and looks about him and if he sees anybody else nodding either wakes them himself or sends his servants to them several other of the old knight's particularities break out upon these occasions sometimes he will be lengthening out a verse in the singing psalms half a minute after the rest of the congregation have done with it sometimes when he is pleased with the matter of his devotion he pronounces amen three or four times to the same prayer and sometimes stands up when everybody else is upon their knees to count the congregation or see if any of his tenants are missing i was yesterday very much surprised to hear my old fellow in the midst of the service calling out to one john matthews to mind what he was about and not disturb the congregation this john matthews it seems is remarkable for being an idle fellow and at the time was kicking his heels for his diversions this authority of the knight though exerted in that odd manner which accompanies him in all circumstances of life has a very good effect upon the parish who are not polite enough to see anything ridiculous in his behaviour besides that the general good sense and worthiness of his character makes his friends observe these little singularities as falls that rather set off them blunish his good qualities as soon as the sermon is finished nobody presumes to stir till sir roger is gone out of the church the knight walks down from his seat in the chancel between a double row of his tenants that stand bowing to him on each side and every now and then inquires how such an oar's wife or mother or son or father do whom he does not see at church which is understood as a secret reprimand to the person that is absent the chaplain has often told me that upon a chatticising day when sir roger has been pleased with a boy that answers well 
he has ordered a bible to be given him next day for his encouragement and sometimes accompanies it with a flitch of bacon to his mother sir roger has likewise added five pounds a year to the clerk's price and that he may encourage the young fellows to make themselves perfect in the church service has promised upon the death of the present incumbent who is very old to bestow it according to merit the fair understanding between sir roger and his chaplain and their mutual concurrence is doing good is the more remarkable because the very next village is famous for the differences and contentions that arise between the parson and the squire who live in a perpetual state of war the parson is always preaching at the squire and the squire to be revenged on the parson never comes to church the squire has made all his tenants atheists and tithy stealers while the parson instructs them every sunday in the dignity of his order and insinuates them in almost every sermon that he is a better man than his patron in short matters are come to such an extremity that the squire has not said his prayers either in public or private this half year and that the parson threatens him if he does not mend his manners to pray for him in the face of the whole congregation feuds of this nature though too frequent in the country are very fatal to the ordinary people who are so used to be dazzled with riches that they pay as much difference to the understanding of a man of an estate as a man of learning and are very hardly brought to regard the truth how important soever it may be that is preached to them when they know there are several men of five hundred a year who do not believe it End of chapter four read by elijah fisher chapter five of days with sir roger de coverley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Chapter five The Widow In my first description of the company in which I pass most of my time, it may be remembered that I mentioned a great affliction which my friend Sir Roger has met with in his youth, which was no less than a disappointment in love it happened this evening that we fell into a very pleasing walk at a distance from his house as soon as we came into it it is quoth the good old man looking round him with a smile very hard that any part of my land should be settled upon one who has used me so ill as the perverse widow did and yet i am sure i could not see a sprig of any bought of this whole walk of trees but i should reflect upon her and her severity she has certainly the finest hand of any woman in the world you are to know this was the place wherein i used to muse upon her and by that custom i can never come into it let the same tender sentiments revive in my mind as if i had actually walked with that beautiful creature under these shades i have been fool enough to carve her name on the bark of several of these trees so unhappy is the condition of men in love to attempt the removing of their passions by the methods which serve only to imprint it deeper she has certainly the finest hand of any woman in the world here followed a profound silence and i was not displeased to observe my friend calling so naturally into a discourse which i had ever been taken notice he industriously invoicated after a very long pause he entered upon an account of this great circumstance in his life with an air which i thought raised my idea above him what i had never had before and gave me the picture of that cheerful mind of his before it received the smoke which has ever since affected his words and actions but 
he went on as follows. I came to my estate in my twenty-second year, and resolved to follow the steps of the most worthy of my ancestors, who have inhabited this spot of earth before me, in all the methods of hospitality and good neighborhood, for the sake of my fame, and in country sports and recreations, for the sake of my wealth. In my twenty-third year, I was obliged to serve as sheriff for the county, and in my servants, officers, and the whole equipage, indulged the pleasure of a young man, who did not think ill of his own person, in making that public occasion of showing my figure and behavior to advantage. You may easily imagine to yourself what appearance I made, who am pretty tall, rid well, and was very well dressed, at the head of a whole county, with music before me, a feather in my hat, and my horse well bitted. I can assure you I was not a little pleased with the kind looks and glances I had from the balconies and windows as I rode to the hall, where the Aziz were held. But when I came there, a beautiful creature in a window's hat sat in court to hear the event of the cause concerning her dower. This commanding creature, who was born for the destruction of all who behold her, put on such a resignation in her countenance, and bore the whispers of all around the court with such a pretty uneasiness, I warrant you, and then recovered herself one eye to another, till she was perfectly confused by meeting something so wistful in all she encountered, that at last, with a moraine to her, she cast her bewitching eye upon me. I no sooner met it, but I bowed like a great surprised booby, and, knowing her cause to be the first which came on, I cried, like a captivated calf as I was, Make way for the defendant's witnesses. This sudden partiality made all the county see the sheriff also was become a slave to the fine widow. During the next time her cause was upon trial, she behaved herself, I warrant you, with such a deep attention to her business, took opportunities to have little billets handed to her counsel, then would be in such a pretty confusion, occasioned, you must know, by acting before so much company, that not only I, but the whole court, was prejudiced in her favor, and all that the next heir to her husband had to urge was thought so groundless and frivolous, that when it came to her counsel to reply, there was not half so much said as every one besides in the court that he could have urged to her advantage. You must understand, sir, this perverse woman is one of those unaccountable creatures that secretly rejoice in the admiration of men, but indulge themselves in no further consequences. Hence is that she has ever had a train of admirers, and she removes from her slaves in town to those in the country, according to the seasons of the year. She is a reading lady, and far gone in the pleasures of friendships. She is always accompanied by a confidant, who is witness to her daily protestance against her sex, and consequently a bar to her steps towards love, upon the strength of her own maxims and declarations. However, I must needs say this accomplished mistress of mine has distinguished me above the rest, and has been known to declare Sir Roger de Coverley was the tamest and most humane of all the brutes in the country. I was told, she said no, by one who thought he railed me, but upon the strength of this slender encouragement of being thought least detestable, I made new liveries, new paired my coach horses, sent them all to town to be bitted and taught to throw their legs well, and move all together, before I pretended to cross the country, 
and wait upon her. As soon as I thought my retinue suitable to the character of my fortune and youth, I set out from hence to make my addresses. The particular skill of this lady has ever been to inflame your wishes, and yet command respect. To make her mistress of all this act, she has a greater share of knowledge, wit, and good sense, than is usual even among men of merit. Then she is beautiful beyond the race of women. If you won't let her go on with a certain artifice of with her eyes and the skill of beauty, she will arm herself with her real charms and strike you with admiration instead of desire. It is certain that if you were to behold the whole woman, there is that dignity in her aspect, that composure in her motion, that complacency in her manner, that if you form makes you hope, her merit makes you fear. But then again, she is in such a disparate scholar that no country gentleman can approach her without being a jest. As I was going to tell you, when I came to her house, I was admitted to her presence with great civility. At the same time, she placed herself to be the first seen by me in such an attitude, as I think you call the posture of a picture, that she discovered new charms, and I at last came towards her with such an awe as made me speechless. This she no sooner observed, but she made her advantage of it, and began a discourse to me concerning love and honour, as they both are followed by pretenders and the real votaries to them. When she discussed these points in a discourse, which I verily believe was as learned as the best philosopher in Europe could possibly make, she asked me whether she was so happy as to fall and with my sentiments on these important particulars. Her confidant sat by her, and upon my being in the last confusion and silence, this malicious aid of hers turning to her says, I am very glad to observe Sir Roger pauses upon this subject, and seems resolved to deliver all his sentiments upon the matter when she pleases to speak. They both kept in their countenances, and after I had sat half an hour meditating how to behave before such profound casuists, I rose up and took my leave. Chance has since that time thrown me very often in her way, and she as often has directed a discourse to me which I do not understand. This barbarity has kept me ever at a distance from the most beautiful object my eyes have ever beheld. It is thus also she deals with all mankind, and you must make love to her, as you would conquer the sphinx, by poisoning her. But where she like other women, and that there were any talking to her, how constant must the pleasure of that man be, who could converse with the creature. But, after all, you may be sure her heart is fixed on some one or other, and yet I have been credibly informed. You can believe half that is said. After she had done speaking to me, she put her hand to her bosom and adjusted her tucker. Then she cast her eyes a little down, upon my beholding her too earnestly. They say she sings excellent. Her voice in her ordinary speech has something in its inexpressibly sweet. You must know I dined with her at a public table the day after I saw her, and she helped me to some tansy in the eye of all the gentlemen in the country. She has certainly the finest hand of any woman in the world. I can assure you, sir, were you to behold her, you would be in the same condition as her speech is music her form is angel-like but i find i grow irregular while i am talking of her but indeed it would be a stupidity 
to be unconcerned at such perfection oh the excellent creature she is as inimitable to all women as she is inaccessible to all men i found my friend begin to rave and insensibly led him towards the house that we might be joined by some other company and am convinced that the widow is the secret cause of all that inconsistently which appears in some parts of my friend's discourse though he has so much command of himself as not directly to mention her yet according to that marsh which only one knows not how to render into english dum tacit hanc loquitur i shall end this paper with that whole epigram which represents with much humour my honest friend's condition quicquid agit rufus nihil est nisi navia rufo si gadet si flet si tacit hanc loquitur cana pro nat poset negat annuit una est navia si non sit navia mutus erit scriberit esterna pari cum lus salutum navia lux in quit navia numen a epig sixty nine one one let rufus weep rejoice stand sit or walk still he can nothing but of navia talk let him eat drink ask questions or dispute still he must speak of navia or be mute he writ to his father ending with this line i am my lovely navia ever thine end of chapter five Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter six of Days with Sir Roger de Coverley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Chapter six The Chase those who have searched into human nature observe that nothing so much shews the nobleness of the soul as that its facility consists in action every man has such an active principle in him that he will find out something to employ himself upon in whatever place or state of life he is posted i have heard of a gentleman who was under close confinement in the bastile seven years during which time he amused himself in scattering a few small pines about his chamber gathering them up again and placing them in different figures on the arm of a great chair he often told his friends afterwards that unless he found out this piece of exercise he verily believed he should have lost his senses after what has been said i need not inform my readers that sir roger with whose character i hope they are at present pretty well acquainted had in his youth gone through the whole course of those rural diversions which the country abounds in and which seem to be extremely well suited to that laborious industry a man may observe here in a far greater degree than in towns and cities i have before hinted at some of my friend's exploits he had in his youthful days taken forty caves of partridges in a season and tried many a salmon with a line consisting but of a single hair the constant thanks and good wishes of the neighbourhood always attended him on account of his remarkable enmity towards foxes having destroyed more of those vermin in one year that it was thought the whole country would, could have produced indeed the knight does not scruple to own among his most imminent friends that in order to establish his reputation this way he has secretly sent for great numbers of them out of the other countries which he used to turn loose about the country by night that he might the better signalize himself in their destruction the next day his hunting horses were the finest and best managed in all these parts his tenants are still full of the praises of a grey stone horse that unhappy stake 
worked himself several years since and was buried with great solemnity in the orchard sir roger being at present too old for fox-hunting to keep himself in action has disposed of his beagles and got a pack of stop hounds with these wanton speed he endeavours to make amends for by the deepness of their mouths and the variety of their notes which are suited in such manner to each other that the whole cry makes up a complete concert he is so nice in this particular that a gentleman having made him a present of a very fine hound the other day the knight returned it by this servant with a great many expressions of civility but desired him to tell his master that the dog he had sent was indeed a most excellent bass and that at present he only wanted a counter tenor could i believe my friend had ever read shakespeare i should certainly conclude he had taken the hint from theseus in the midsummer night's dream my hounds are bred out of the spartan kind so fluid so sanded and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew crook heeded and dew-lapped like thessalian bulls slow in pursuit and matched in mouths like bells each under each a cry more tunable was never hollowed to nor cheated with horn sir roger is so keen at this sport that he has been out almost every day since i came down and upon the chaplain's offering to lend me his easy pad i was prevailed on yesterday morning to make one of the company i was extremely pleased as we rid along to observe the general benevolence of all the neighbourhood towards my friend the farmer's sons thought themselves happy if they could open a gate for the good old knight as he passed by which he generally requited with a nod or a smile and a kind of inquiry after their fathers and uncles after we had rid about a mile from home we came upon a large heath and the sportsmen began to beat they had done so for some time when as i was at a little distance from the rest of the company i saw a hare pop out from a small furze brake almost under my horse's feet i marked the way she took which i endeavoured to make the company sensible of my extending my arms but to no purpose till sir roger who knows that none of my extraordinary motions are insignificant rode up to me and asked me if puss was gone that way upon my answering yes he immediately called in the dogs and put them upon the scent as they were going off i heard one of the country fellows muttering to his companion that twas a wonder they had not lost all their sport for want of the silent gentleman's crying stole away this with my aversion to leaping hedges made me withdraw to a raising ground from whence i could have the pleasure of the whole chase without the fatigue of keeping in with the hounds the hare immediately threw them above a mile behind her but i was pleased to find that instead of running straight forwards or in hunter's language flying the country as i was afraid she might have done she wheeled about and described a sort of circle round the hill where i had taken my station in such manner as gave me a very distinct view of the sport i could see her first pass by and the dog some time afterwards unravelling the whole track she had made and following her through all her doubles i was at the same time delighted in observing that difference which the rest of the pack paid to each particular hound according to the character he had acquired amongst them if they were at fault and an old hound of reputation opened but once he was immediately followed by the whole cry while a raw dog or one who was a noted liar must have yelped his heart out without being taken notice of the hare now after having squatted two or three times had been put up again as often came still nearer to the place where she was at first started 
the dogs pursued her and these were followed by the jolly knight who rode upon a white gelding encompassed by his tenants and servants and cheering his hounds with all the gaiety of five and twenty one of the sportsmen rode up to me and told me that he was sure the chase was almost at an end because the old dogs which had hitherto lain behind now headed for the pack the fellow was in the right our hare took a large field just under us followed by the full cry in view i must confess the brightness of the weather the cheerfulness of everything around me the chiding of the hounds which was returned upon as in a double echo from two neighbouring hills with the hollowing of the sportsman and the sounding of the horn lifted my spirits into a most lively pleasure which i freely indulged because i was sure it was innocent if i was under any concern it was on the account of the poor hare that was now quite spent and almost within the reach of her enemies when the huntsman getting forward threw down his pole before the dogs which were now eight yards of that game which they had been pursuing for almost as many hours yet on the signal before mentioned they all made a sudden stand and though they continued opening as much as said before durst had not once attempted to pass beyond the pole at the same time sir roger rode forward and alighting took up the hare in his arms which he soon delivered to one of his servants with an order if she be kept alive to let her go in his great orchard where it seems he has several of those prisoners of war who live together in a very comfortable captivity i was highly pleased to see the discipline of the pack and the good nature of the knight who could not find in his heart to murder a creature that had given him so much diversion as we were returning home i remember that monsieur Pachal, in his most excellent discourse of the misery of man tells us that all our endeavours are after greatness proceed from nothing but a desire of being surrounded by a multitude of persons and affairs that may hinder us from looking into ourselves which is a view we cannot bear he afterwards goes on to show that our love of sports comes from the same reason and is particularly severe upon hunting what says he unless it be to drawn thought can make men throw away so much time and pains upon a silly animal which they thought they might buy cheaper in the market the foregoing reflection is certainly just when a man suffers his whole mind to be drawn into his sports and altogether loses himself in the woods but does not affect those who propose a far more laudable end for this exercise i mean the preservation of health and keeping all the organs of the soul in a condition to execute her orders had that incomparable person whom i last quoted been a little more indulgent to himself in this point the world might probably have enjoyed him much longer whereas through to great an application to his studies in his youth he contracted that ill habit of body which after a tedious sickness carried him off in the fortieth year of his age and the whole history we have of his life till that time is but one continued account of the behaviour of the noble soul struggling under innumerable pains and distempers for my own part i intend to hunt twice a week during my stay with sir roger and shall prescribe the moderate use of this exercise to all my country friends as the best kind of physic for mending a bad constitution and preserving a good one i cannot do this better than in the following lines out of mr dryden the first physicians by debauch were made excess began and sloth sustains the trade by chance our long-lived fathers earned their food toil strung the nerves and purified the blood but we their sons a pampered race of men are dwindled down to threescore years of ten better to hunt in fields for health unbought than fee the doctor for a nauseous draught 
the wise for cure on exercise depend god made his work for man to mend end of chapter six read by elijah fisher chapter seven of days with sir roger de coverley this librivox recording is in the public domain days with sir roger de coverley by joseph addison and richard steele chapter seven the country Aziz. a man's first care should be to avoid the reproaches of his own heart his next to escape the censures of the world if the last interferes with the former it ought to be entirely neglected but otherwise there cannot be a greater satisfaction to an honest mind than to see those approbations which it gives itself second by the applausibles of the public a man is more sure of his conduct when the verdict which he passes upon his own behaviour is thus warranted and confirmed by the opinion of all that we know him my worthy friend sir roger is one of those who is not only at peace with himself but beloved and esteemed by all about him he receives a suitable tribute for his universal benevolence to mankind in the returns of affection and good will which are paid him by every one that lives within his neighbourhood i lately met with two or three old instances of that general respect which is shown to the good old knight he would needs carry mr will wimble and myself to him to the country Aziz. as we were upon the road will wimble joined a couple of plain men who ridded before us and conversed with them for some time during which my friend sir roger acquainted me with their characters the first of them says he that has a spaniel by his side is a yeoman of about a hundred pounds a year an honest man he is just within the game act and qualified to kill an heir or a peasant he knocks down a dinner with his gun twice or thrice a week and by that means lives much cheaper than those who have not so good an estate as himself he would be a good neighbour if he did not destroy so many partridges in short he is a very sensible man shoots flying and has been several times foreman of the pretty jury the other that rides along with him is tom touchy a fellow famous for taking the law of everybody there is not one in the town where he lives that he has not sued at a quarter sessions the rogue had once the impudence to go to law with the widow his head is full of costs damages and ejectments he plagued a couple of honest gentlemen so long for a trespass in breaking one of his hedges till he was forced to sell the ground it enclosed to defray the charges of the prosecution his father left him fourscore pounds a year but he has cast and been cast so often that he is now worth thirty i suppose he is going upon the old business of the willow tree sir roger was giving me this account of tom touchy will wimble and his two companions stopped short till we came up to them after having paid their respects to sir roger will told him that mr touchy and he must appeal to him upon a dispute that arose between them will it seems had been giving his fellow-traveller an account of his angling one day in such a hole when tom touchy instead of hearing out his story told him that mr such a one if he pleased might take the law of him for fishing in that part of the river my friend sir roger heard them both upon a round trot and after having paused some time told them with an air of a man who would not give his judgment rashly that much might be said on both sides they were neither of them dissatisfied with the knight's determination because neither of them found himself in the wrong by it upon which we made the best of our way to the Aziz. the court was sat before sir roger came not but notwithstanding all the justices had taken their places upon the bench they made room for the old knight at the head of them who for his reputation in the country took occasion to whisper in the judge's ear that he was glad his lordship had met with so good weather in his circuit 
I was listening to the proceeding of the court with much attention, and infinitely pleased with that great appearance and solemnity which so properly accompanies such a public administration of our laws, when, after about an hour sitting, I observed to my great surprise, in the midst of a trial, that my friend Sir Roger was getting up to speak. I was in some pain for him, till I found he had acquitted himself of two or three sentences, with a look of much business and great intrepidity. Upon his rising, first rising the court was hushed, and a general whisper ran among the country people that Sir Roger was up. The speech he made was so little to the purpose, that I shall not trouble my readers with an account of it, and, I believe, was not so much designed by the knight himself to inform the court as to give him a figure of in my eye, and keep up his credit in the country. I was highly delighted when the court rose, to see the gentlemen of the country gathering about my old friend, and striving who should compliment him most, at the same time that the ordinary people gazed upon him at a distance, not a little admiring his courage, that was not afraid to speak to the judge. In our return home we met with a very odd accident, which I cannot forbear relating, because it shows how desirous all who know Sir Roger, are of giving him marks of their esteem. When we were arrived upon the verge of his estate, we stopped at a little inn to rest ourselves and our horses. The man of the house had, it seems, been formerly a servant in the knight's family, and to do honour to his old master, had some time since, unknown to Sir Roger, put him up in a signpost before the door, so that the knight's head had hung out upon the road about a week before he himself knew anything of the matter. As soon as Sir Roger was acquainted with it, finding that his servant's indiscretion proceeded wholly up from affection and good will, he only took him that he had made him too high a compliment, and when the fellow seemed to think that could hardly be, added with a more decisive look, that it was too great an honour for any man under a duke, but told him at the same time that it might be altered with a very few touches, and that he himself would be at the charge of it. Accordingly, they got a painter, by the knight's directions, to add a pair of whiskers to the face, and by a little aggravation of the features to change it into the sarsarin's head. I should not have known this story had not the innkeeper, upon Sir Roger's alighting, told him in my hearing that his honour's head was brought back last night with the alterations that he had ordered to be made in it. Upon this my friend, with his usual cheerfulness, related the particulars above mentioned, and ordered the head to be brought into the room. I could not forbear discovering greater expressions of mirth than ordinary upon the appearance of this monstrous face, under which, notwithstanding it was made to frown and stare in a most extraordinary manner, I could still discover a distant resemblance of my old friend. Sir Roger, upon seeing me laugh, desired me to tell him truly if I thought it possible for people to know him in that disguise. I at first kept my usual silence, but upon the knight's conjuring me to tell him whether it was not still more like himself than a sarsarin, I composed my countenance in the best manner I could, and replied that much might be said on both sides. These several adventures, with the knight's behaviour in them, gave me a pleasant as a day as ever I met with any of my travels. End of chapter 7 Read by Elijah Fisher Chapter 8 of Days with Sir Roger de Coverley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Chapter 8 The Spectators Return to Town. Having notified to my good friend Sir Roger that I should let set out for London the next day, his horses were ready at the appointed hour in the evening, and attended by one of his grooms. 
i arrived at the country town at twilight in order to be ready for the stage-coach the following day as soon as we arrived at the inn the servant who waited upon me inquired of the chamberlain in my hearing what company he had for the coach the fellow answered mrs betty arabel the great fortune and the widow her mother a recruiting officer who took a place because they were to go young squire quickset her cousin that her mother wished her to be married to ephraim the quaker her guardian and a gentleman that had studied himself dumb from sir roger de coverley's i observed by what he said of myself that according to his office he dealt much in intelligence and doubted not but there was some foundation for his reports for the rest of the company as well as for the whimsical account he gave of me the next morning at daybreak we were all called and i who knew my own natural sighness and endeavour to be as little liable to be disputed with as possible dressed immediately that i might make no one wait the first preparation of our setting out was that the captain's half-pike was placed near the coachman and a drum behind the coach in the meantime the drummer the captain's equipage was very loud that none of the captain's things should be placed as so as to be spoiled upon which his cloak-bag was fixed in the seat of the coach and the captain himself according to a frequent though invidious behaviour of military men ordered his man to look sharp that none but one of the ladies should have the place he had taken affronting to the coach-box we were in some little time fixed in our seats and sat with that dislike which people not too good-natured usually conceive of each other at first sight the coach jumbled us insensibly into some sort of familiarity and we had not moved above two miles when the widow asked the captain what success he had in his recruiting the officer with a frankness he believed very graceful told her that indeed he had been very little luck and suffered much by desertion therefore should be glad to end his warfare in the service of her as were her fair daughter in a word continued he i am a soldier and to be plain is my character you see madam young sound and impudent take me yourself widow or give me to her i will be wholly at your disposal i am a soldier of fortune ha this was followed by a vain laugh of his own and a deep silence of all the rest of the company i had nothing left for it but to fall fast asleep which i did with all speed come said he resolve upon it we will make a wedding at the next town we will wake this pleasant companion who has fallen asleep to be the brideman and giving the quaker a clap on the knee he concluded this sly saint who i'll warrant understands what's what as well as uh, you or i widow shall give the bride as father the quaker who happened to be a man of smartness answered friend i take it in good part that thou hast given me the authority of the of a father over this comely and virtuous child and i must assure thee that if i have the giving her i shall not bestow her on thee thy mirth friend savoureth of folly thou art a person of a light mind the drum is a type of thee it soundeth because it is empty verily it is not from thy fullness but thy emptiness that thou hast spoken this day friend friend we have hired this coach in partnership with thee to carry us to the great city we cannot go any other way this worthy mother must hear thee if thou wilt needs utter thy follies we cannot help it friend i say if thou wilt we must hear thee but if thou wert a man of understanding thou wouldst not take advantage of thy courageous countenance to abash us children of peace thou art thou sayest a soldier give quarter to us who cannot resist thee 
why didst thou fleer at our friend who feigned himself asleep he said nothing but how dost thou know what he containeth if thou speakest improper things in the hearing of this virtuous young virgin consider it as an outrage against a distressed person then it cannot get from thee to speak indiscreetly what we are obliged to hear by being hasted up with thee in this public vehicle is some degree assaulting on the high road here epiphane paused and the captain with a happy and uncommon impudence which can be convicted and support itself in the same time cries faith friend i thank thee i should have been a little impertinent if thou hadst not reprimanded me come thou art i see a smoky old fellow and i'll very orderly the ensuing part of my journey i was going to give myself airs but ladies i beg pardon the captain was so little out of humour and our company was so far from being surpowered by this little ruffle that ephraim and he took a particular delight in being agreeable to each other for the future and assumed their different provinces in the conduct of the company our reckonings apartments and accommodation fell under ephraim and the captain looked to all disputes upon the road as the good behaviour of our coachman and the right we had of taking place as going to london of all vehicles coming from thence the occurrences we met with were ordinary and very little happened which could entertain by the relation of them but when i considered the company we were in i took it for no small good fortune that the whole journey was not spent in impertinences which to be the one part of us might be an entertainment to the other a suffering what therefore a prame said when we were almost arrived at london had to me an air not only of good understanding but good breeding upon the young lady's expressing her satisfaction in the journey and declaring how delightful it had been to her ephraim delivered himself as follows there is no ordinary part of human life which expresses so much a good mind and a right inward man as his behaviour upon meeting with strangers especially such as it may seem the most unsuitable companions to him such a man when he falleth in the way of with persons of simplicity and innocence however knowing he may be in the ways of men will not vaunt himself thereof but will the rather hide his superiority to them that he may not be painful unto them my good friend continued he turning to the officer thee and i are apt to part by and by and peradventure we we never meet again but be advised by a plain man modes and apparel are but trifles to the real man therefore do not think such a man as thyself terrible for thy garb nor such a one as me contemptible or mine when two such as thee and i meet with affections as we ought to have towards each other thou shouldst rejoice to see my peaceable demeanour and i should be glad to see thy strength and ability to protect me in it End of chapter eight End of Days with Sir Roger de Coverley by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele Read by Elijah Fisher